Yeah. Uh, I'm Brian Kelly. Welcome to A2 New Tech. Thank you for finding your way down to our subterranean home this evening. Um, who uh, has been here for the first time this evening? First timers. Welcome. Love our first timers. We have over 5,000 members. Um, how many people are here at a company that is uh, hiring right now? Hiring, looking for tech people. How many people are looking maybe to find job? Well, you're in the right place. Right on. Um, so we've been doing this since uh, 2009, you believe it or not. Uh, I've been your host just a little bit over a year. We've had over 100 meetups, over 300 companies have pitched. And um, why do we do this? So, uh, you know, we're in a small community, and while you think you would get time to meet every other entrepreneur or technologist in town, uh, it's hard to. And it's, it's really important to take the time to get in the same physical space together and meet somebody interesting. If you do one thing tonight uh, that I would highly recommend is meet somebody here that you'll continue a conversation with. Guarantee to find them, uh, just have a lot of conversations. So um, uh, let's see, uh, big thank yous to, uh, first off, uh, U of M Law School and the Entrepreneurship Clinic. Dana Thompson is not here, but she's our new uh, Bryce Pills, who's moved over to the Office of Tech Transfer. They donate the space to us, make it happen every month. We're usually not redirected at the very last minute, so either way, we got some good digs here to hang out in. Uh, A2 New Tech is uh, a nonprofit dedicated to make Southeast Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Shout out to A2 Geeks. Uh, Roger Rail down here making the video happen at R25. Uh, Roger has been recording, live streaming, uh, and documenting these uh, awesome events we have every month for as long as I can remember. Um, and uh, all the other organizers. I don't. I don't do this alone. There's a whole group of us that volunteer to curate the speakers at each month and um, host it. So. Doug down here in the front, I saw Zach Steinler up in the back there, uh, Scott, David, and everyone else. Um, they're the ones that said, like, we should do this, and we should volunteer our time to make it happen. So uh, our agenda this evening uh, will have five companies. Each are going to pitch for five minutes, followed by audience Q&A for five minutes. I'll keep the timer down in the front, and uh, I'll call out questions. Um, so just raise your hand when we do that part. Um, we'll, we'll run till 8 o'clock at the latest, maybe, maybe sooner than that. And uh, after all of the presentations, we'll time for community announcements. So if you're hiring, if you're looking for work, if you have another meetup, if you're another event that you think people in this room would want to know about, uh, we'll make some time for you to come down in front and make that announcement. And afterward, uh, there's always a good group of people that uh, end up coming from this group and going over to Pizza House, where we grab some food and drinks and continue the conversation. If you um, know somebody after watching the pitches tonight, if you or somebody you know might want to pitch here, email organizers at a2newtech.org. Uh, it's always the third Tuesday of each month, and um, always in typically in this, this building. Uh, yeah, email us, uh, and we'll talk about, you know, mainly we want to know, do you have some uh, customer traction, whether it's beta customers, even better paying customers. That's usually the criteria we have by to, to filter who's kind of ready to pitch here. And then you have a product more commonly. Maybe a, maybe a service and they will buy a, a product, but um, those are the basic criteria. I always love uh, telling you all what podcasts I'm listening to. Um, I, and this is a repeat from last month, just because this guy rocks, this guy, Nathan Latka. This is a podcast called The Top. Uh, this guy, this is a young, young guy who has interviewed over 80 founders at SaaS companies. And he just like gets right into all the metrics. So their cost of customer acquisition, their average customer lifetime value, uh, their revenue, their revenue the year before, their churn rate. He gets them to spill it all. I, I'm surprised at quite how much information is shared on it. So uh, Nathan Latka, like it sounds like, L-A-T-K-A dot com. He also puts up a spreadsheet every time he interviews a company with all their metrics. So sort of like demystifying, you know, how are these companies getting there? Um, so if you're thinking of building any kind of software business, um, even more specifically for him, B2B, SaaS business, go check his stuff out. Um, cool. I think, oh, oh and I uh, also want to mention again that Stephen from Ash and Anvil, who is presented here, the clothing for short guys, he's one of the people interviewed this past summer on that podcast. Um, 
That's, that's it. it. So, so yeah, yeah, if uh, housekeeping, you know, there's restrooms down the hall, and um, we're going to jump right into it. So I'm uh, please welcome uh, Leo Sonata from uh, As. Uh, uh, As Hmm, he's going to have to pronounce this for me. <laughs> Asdesen. Asdesen. Uh, he's a mobile app based uh, robot, a career advisor for high school and university, uh, first and second grade students, to find and meet role models and peers who have similar interests and passions. Uh, and as soon as Leo gets projecting, I'm going to let him take it away. together uh, about the high school and university students. So uh, one day I found uh, like a survey uh, done by a, a public institution. And then it says like uh, the many students have some anxiety about the future. And then like uh, this is a number, like a 60 to 80 percent of the students feel some kind of anxiety about the recruitment, about the college, something like that. Like that. And then like I'm from Japan, like I was surprised that 80 percent of students feel some anxiety about the future. And then I thought, why? Um, like looking back, my uh, like uh, old days, like uh, I thought, like there are so many like uh, opportunities. Like uh, I technically know about the name of those like uh, professions, but uh, like I I had no idea how to become that kind of people. Like uh, what kind of people people do lawyers and engineers something like that. So like I thought like um, I was like a scarce in uh, role models. I didn't know much about the uh, like, uh, outside world. Like, uh, I knew only about like, uh, um, my parents and the teachers. The, uh, of, of, of occupation is that, that's it. And also, like, um, I didn't know much about like, how to search the uh, web. And then like, uh, even, even if I had some time, and then I wanted to talk with the school counselor, they were all busy. So essentially, like, uh, many students, including me, had, uh, like, uh, don't have enough information to think about their future. And then that's going to be your uh, like, uh, anxiety about the future. Uh, I thought this is a problem to think about their future. So uh, my approach, I came up with uh, an idea uh, to push the students to start thinking about their future as early as possible uh, with adequate guidances. But uh, like I found another problem uh, to this uh, solution. If I do operate uh, this idea with just a human, it's going to be very uh, like expensive because, like for example, career advisors, I, like uh, hourly rate is almost like uh, one hundred fifty dollars. And then if I driven, uh, if I uh, operate this business or human, it's going to be not scalable. So that's going to be a problem. So um, I invent an idea to create AI. Let's call uh, his name Jeff. And uh, if you are, uh, if uh, the answer is Jeff, like the AI is uh, very very cheap. And then uh, Jeff can work 24 hours in time. So uh, I, I, I came up with the idea to put in uh, Jeff in uh, uh, like a mobile uh, app and also a website. So uh, I'm going to present uh, like a, what Jeff can do. The Jeff, is, Jeff can chat with students. So uh, uh, like career counseling is very complicated. So uh, uh, I have not yet uh, invented a uh, very super cool like, chatbot yet. But uh, uh, like, uh, my uh, idea is that students can like, uh, uh, ask some questions, and then Jeff can work with uh, some human under the human under the human's uh, supervision. Uh, Jeff can some advice. Hey, like, uh, what's your dream? And then if you don't have dream, you should look at this video. That kind of things. The second, um, Jeff can introduce some professionals to students. So uh, like, um, I don't use. Tinder anymore because I have a wife and a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, like, like, uh, like uh, Jeff can ask you, like, uh, hey, do you like this kind of profile guy? And then like, he's like sometimes super like, 
And then, okay, like, oh, I understand you. And then I can introduce you the kind of like people and you should uh, meet one of these guys. And then once you push, and then uh, you can talk with uh, maybe in this case lawyer and then talk about like the future and then what the lawyer will do, that kind of things. Then other things, uh, Jeff can advise, hey, if you want to become a lawyer, you should go to this school. You should uh, watch this video and then you should uh, read this book, that kind of thing. Um, Jeff can advise. That's it. Uh, so uh, while I'm here, uh, I'm seeking people uh, to work uh, and then to create this uh, the super cool uh, chatbot. And then um, I have some team, and uh, I actually started business uh, like five years ago. And then I, I have some foundation. But the uh, thing is, like I don't have uh, like a tech side people. So uh, like um, if some people are interested in my idea, and then if uh, one of you know about the like, chatbot, deep learning, that kind of things. Um, I'm, more, uh, I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, if you've got some questions, then you can fire away. I don't know. How do you plan on monetizing Yeah, I um, Hopefully, usually, 
But uh, in this case, like, you can use uh, your uh, part of time, uh, like part of time to still make a little money. And then, um, so in this case, children can uh, subscribe individually, and also uh, school can subsidize the students uh, to use this service. So actually, um, students um, do not pay, and also uh, like the lawyers, um, they, they sometimes feel uh, they want to get a like, if, if, if lawyer work with uh, like clients, they need, they have to uh, like, uh, charge five hundred dollars an hour or something like that. But in this case, this is a uh, different context. Um, so the role models like uh, pay for to the next generation people. So uh, that's kind of like the things I need to promote. Uh, I need to like uh, uh, to to uh, work with. That's a great uh, well, and you could also try like professional organizations, and people could you know do yes. it as a you know, you know a service for their professional organization or something. But that might be a target audience to get along. Yes. yes. All right. Uh, you know, Leo's going to be around later on. This whole time for questions right now. But thank you. We have. Thank you. from Find Your Ditto. Find Your Ditto is a mobile platform that connects individuals living with the same chronic illnesses locally for on-demand, in-person support. Hi, um, so my name is Parisa. I'm a master's candidate um, uh, in health informatics here. And I co-founded Find Your Ditto. And so uh, one half of all adults in the US live with a chronic illness. And so that can be anything from depression, diabetes, cancer, um, the whole range of illnesses. Um, but the problem with these illnesses is that they're often invisible. Um, you're not standing there saying, hey, I have depression, or um, it's really hard to know, you know, standing in this room, um, who has what and how to find others who are really going through similar experiences. Um, and this loneliness um, and isolation um, is associated with amplified symptoms, um, obesity, smoking, a sedentary lifestyle, um, and a decrease in medication adherence um, among patients. And so we kind of set out uh, to connect this fragmented community um, and provide on-demand in-person support. So right now you can go online and you know maybe you find people, find support systems that they could be 50, 500 miles away. Um, and really having it on demand. So if I'm having a bad diabetes say today, um, I can find someone around me who can um, be supportive and just meet with me and um, to talk. So we piloted um, in February at U of M. Um, we set out calls saying, hey, if any student is living with a chronic illness, sign up, we'll match you up over coffee. Um, within a few weeks, over 100 students signed up um, across 40 different illnesses. And we have a 90% match rate, which means even individuals who live with an illness that's one in 50,000 people, um, very rare illnesses, we're finding matches on this campus. So college populations are kind of uh, one geographic area that have a lot of diverse people, um, but same age range to, to really connect. And people um, are willing to uh, and wanting to do this. So. Our focus and, and our feedback we're tracking um, is emotional support. And with an increased emotional support, um, you have, according to the literature, increased health outcomes. So that's really what we're trying to track. And um, since then, we've um, developed a web application um, that we're beta testing right now. Um, and it basically, you can identify your illnesses, send requests for an in-person meetup, and have it be anonymous messaging up until the point that you meet up. Um, right now we're starting with students, um, and we'll be launching the, um, uh, at U of M and MSU pilots. Um, and we've been talking with um, the universities to go through the pilot um, and see how the results go with our automated platform. Um, so people, students are meeting other students. Um, then we're looking um, at health systems. So. Um, uh, right now, Kaiser Permanente, it's a health system in California. They're interested um, in using this uh, to pilot for their support groups, um, and hopefully uh, University of Michigan as well, because of the geographic range. 
And finally, opening it up to the general public. And this would be all subscription models um, uh, on a yearly basis. So um, here's a little bit about us. So we've done some pitch competitions, went through Spark Boot Camps, on some little words, um, we're really, our vision is that no individual living with a chronic illness ever has to be alone. So from the moment of diagnosis, um, you know that you're not the only one living with um, your chronic illness, and you can find people more like you or, um, around to really uh, connect with. Um, we're looking for a technical co-founder to join our team. We've been um, uh, the, the people that we've had so far are part-time. Um, so if anyone is interested, please, please talk to me. Um, we're an Ann Arbor-based company, and um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. He's got some questions. So since you're dealing with such a sensitive subject with chronic illnesses, you yeah. kind of talked, touched a little bit about being anonymous. How do you deal with security with this information and comfortable people being comfortable with doing this? Right. Um, so we are kind of operating in that whatever information people are, are giving us, it's kind of up to them. Um, so our privacy policies kind of uh, uh, are similar to something like Match.com or um, I don't know, uh, basically whatever they put is on them, but we are making steps to collect as little information, at least at this time. Um, when we're working with the health systems, um, we really are, are going to be working on a HIPAA compliant server um, within that health system, probably provided by them. Um, but uh, yes, we're trying to collect as, as little information as we can. Yeah, you'll definitely have to be HIPAA compliant for this business model. But uh, my other question is, have you explored patient satisfaction? Uh, and that's a key metric. For example, if you look at Kaiser Permanente, you know, that's a pair provider linked model. Uh, patient satisfaction for other models obviously uh, increases reimbursement and revenue per patient. Is that a value proposition that you're presenting to your yeah. customers? Yeah, um, especially because it takes some time to, to see how much emotional support over time is, it, you know, for individual patient is being increased. But patient satisfaction is definitely something that um, immediately, you know, this is another service that the university offers or that health system offers um, in addition to whatever they have. So that that actually um, that is a really great point, and I think it probably trumps. Um, I, I, I would just tell you, having worked in hospitals, it's yeah. the number one value proposition is patient satisfaction because it correlates to patient surveys, which correlates to increased reimbursements and revenue per patient. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And hi there. I love the idea of connecting. I think that's great. I was just wondering what you're doing specifically to, say, distinguish yourself from Facebook. In other words, why would somebody, you know, do your site as opposed to Facebook? Yeah. Or how do you entice people? Right. Um, so uh, we really want to keep this as anonymous as possible. With Facebook, there are Facebook groups. Twitter has some communities going on, um, and also meetup groups. That's actually what we position our biggest competitor. Um, we are operating on being on demand. Um, so you know if. You know, uh, utilizing the community right when you need it, and also not having your Facebook photo shown, your information. These are issues that you might not even want a coworker or an employer to know um, that you're even reaching out for support. So that's kind of our positioning on that. I think it's an awesome product. Uh, thank, thank you for you. coming up with the idea. I would think you get a lot of, it's just a comment more than a question, you get a lot of uptake through the insurance community mm -hmm. uh, because they've offered similar services like Nurse Line in the past, which are connecting with nurses who as needed on demand. But if you filter that through the employer insurance networks, you, you might get a lot more. Uh Absolutely. A lot more stuff through there. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, we're actively doing customer discovery with insurance companies, so if anyone knows anyone that can connect us, that'd be great. What's your more value strategy? How do you make money? Um, so this is um, a subscription model um, to universities and health systems, um, and uh, so that, that's those are the uh, the pilots that we're doing right now. 
Um, so it'd be yearly basis um, on however many people are using the product. So is it is it a silo? So University of Michigan has it, but Michigan State cannot use the same database. Um, um, so because there's like Mich if it if it was U of M and Eastern, eventually we'll look at um, kind of having it be together because when you have more people, that's more connection. But right now it's East Lansing and Ann Arbor; those are separate communities, so keeping it separate. One yeah, if, if people are finding the service because they need on-demand help, how do you move the population of people from needing constant help to being in a position to give back and help others then? Yeah, so our longer-term vision is, you know, um, right now uh, we're only just facilitating this, these meetups, but we want people to kind of grow these connections and then um, link it back to um, events going on, um, Things that they can use their community to meet health goals uh, and keep keep growing this community and make it a little more tight knit. All right, that's uh, that's a uh, that's a wrap for Frisa. Thank you so much. All right, uh, moving right along, uh, Daniel Jeffries uh, is going to tell us about Give and Take Incorporated. Uh, Give and Take makes smart tools for building engagement and social capital. solve this problem. Three lessons that we've learned recently, and if we have time, what we're trying to do next. So the big problem is employees are disengaged at work, and it's costing billions of dollars. 87% um, of work, uh, workers worldwide are disengaged. Um, it's, it's a pain that's known in the C-suite, um, and it's, it's costing a lot of money. Um, so let's talk about this team that's been working for 10 years to solve this problem. Um, the team at Give and Get uh, started over 10 years ago with the Reciprocity Ring, which is an in-person experience. That experience has had over 40,000 paid users, lots of great results, ROI, um, and uh, really good experiences and good um, meaningful connections made between people in many different organizations. Um, so recently, that team has started, uh, has built, and has uh, started um, uh, gaining pilots for this Give and Get app, right? Um, we've, we've worked with a number of different organizations, and the, the online version or the, the web version of this has, given, has created the same results, um, really, as the reciprocity ring, lots of meaningful connections. Um, and that we've learned those three lessons that, we, that are really what's, what's driving what we want to do next. So you might ask at this point, this great, this give and get app we've been talking about, how does it actually work? Um, so how it works is, it's an experience that allows people to make requests for help, makes it easy to make those requests, uh, to offer help to others, and then to express gratitude for the help that they receive. And the reason the reciprocity ring works, and the reason the give and get app works, is because when people do this, they have this experience that opens up their mind to wow, look at all, everything we can accomplish. And there's a bunch of great stories about that. Unfortunately, I don't have, have a time to share those. Um, one of the folks that has uh, done that pilot that we were talking about, one of those three organizations is Zingerman's, um, which is a local organization that you guys know. And uh, they had a the great experience with the, the pilot that they ran. They increased a 60, they had a 60% increase in social capital across their seven business units. What social capital means is it's the connections between people, right? It's an increased density in the connections between people and how people are helping each other. Um, and we're really excited that, um, that Zingerman's wants to be an ongoing customer. So it's our first customer of the Give and Get app that wants to continue to be a customer after the pilot. So that's really exciting for us. Um, so I talked about those three lessons, right? These three pilots, we, would, we, we learned some things across these three pilots. And so I want to share those with you. 
one of the things that we've learned is we created this experience to target all employees. And what customers have told us is actually, we want you to target even more specifically the onboarding of our new hires. These are folks that have start with zero connections, zero understanding of culture. They're really where we want you to target this experience. Second lesson that we've learned uh, is that um, this onboarding experience is really tough for companies. They have solutions in place for compliance and clarification. So like the information sharing part of onboarding, here's the information you need to know, here's the paperwork you need to fill out. Those solutions are in place. Only 20% of companies are addressing culture and connection in their onboarding. So these are the two things that make you feel like, this is a place for me. I belong here. It's not just information, it's connection. Um, one side of that equation is, is called human capital. This other side is called social capital. So we're targeting that. And the third lesson is, so we, we have a web app that is kind of a standalone uh, solution, but we learned that, uh, surprise, surprise, customers want uh, a solution that works with what they already have. So their human capital systems like Workday and Success Factors, they want that to tie to a social capital onboarding tool like Give and Get, and they don't want Give and Get to be its own messaging uh, infrastructure and collaboration infrastructure. They want it to work on top of Yammer, Slack, the messaging that they already have. So that, those are the those are our three lessons. Um, so uh, we'll kind of end up, end with um, a statement from GM's chief talent officer, kind of emphasizing this shift from the human capital focus to social capital and solving these problems socially rather than just giving people information. Um, have a really fantastic team here. I'm running out of time, so we'll just move forward. We've got some great advisors, including uh, Adam Grant, who's a New York Times best-selling author of Give and Take and Originals. And we would love to get um, some help from the community, and you can read what we need up there. Awesome, awesome pitch, awesome company. Who's uh, got some questions? All right, go ahead. So, uh, uh, is it was a pay per head per employee. Um, yes, there was a. I believe there's a, a fee for the pilot itself, and then there was a per user fee. What is a per user fee? Um, I just joined a couple months ago, so I don't actually know. The twenty-five dollars per user was that right? Per month. Twenty dollars per user. Per yeah. month. Uh, for the pilot, was it one time right? For the pilot, or was it per month? For the pilot. Just for the pilot. Okay, so it was one time for the pilot, but ongoing. It will be a per. Um, that is a really good question. We, we have our chief scientist right here. Wayne, would you like to take that question? Yeah, there's a whole variety of social network measures that the team knows and uses, and we put together a, a, a combination of those. We presented a very simple one here, which was an increase in the density of the network. That was a very simple one, but we have a set of metrics that help detect the extent to which you actually, in a quantitative way, increase social capital in an organization. Uh, is it generally available to buy? Um, so we are. In, we, there's a lot of people interested in doing pilots. I, I think that so we're we're definitely interested in running more pilots. Yeah, we, we, we do an onboarding class every week. We hire basically a person a day. So yeah. 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 It's not clear to me. Is it collaboration where or uh, onboarding where? And if it's the latter, wouldn't M and A be a better market because it's well known that. Uh, M&A is a very sticky uh, place for yeah. onboarding. So we've had conversations with customers, like uh, customer development conversations, and M&A has been brought up in those conversations a lot because it's so painful. Um, what we, so it's kind of this, do we target M&A, do we target onboarding? And I, I'll even tell you, McKinsey, DCG, all these guys, they, they actually uh, basically broker through yeah. Yeah, all these M&A trans transactions. So if you can get into that business, and take, eat their lunch, yeah. Yeah. you might have some. Ultimately, we want to do both, but so, so far, far in our customer development, uh, uh, onboarding seems to be a little more increased. Um, so that's just a little bit. Yeah, we're going to 
Who are the marquee customers? Are you looking for marquee customers right now? Or, I mean, Zingerman's, they're well known locally, but, you know. Yeah, so, so the three pilots that have are University of Toronto, correct? Um, Zingerman's. We'd be happy to chat because we're going fast, but we have all the fastest growing companies in the U.S. are company, customers of ours. So. Yeah. We can make introductions to all those folks, Facebook and Twitter and so forth. Additional team members, what, what kind of team members outside of software engineering are you looking for? Yeah, yeah I think, um, I, I think the most you need right now is software engineering. Um, uh, we're willing to pay. Um, <laughs> so, 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 to scale as we get the capital um, to scale. So we're gonna need folks working and um, working to you know develop the market, we're gonna need folks in design, we're gonna need I mean we're gonna want we're gonna want to make those friends and relationships. Can you can you comment on how much you're looking to raise? Um, well uh, one of our investors is here. Uh, five hundred Uh, oh, one more question right there. So, so how does this work? I took a great class with a great professor to talk about the reciprocity rate. But how does this work? I go to start a new company, General Motors, for example. How does this work for me? What do you do for me to get my network grown within General Motors? Right, yeah. So so we've got, it's funny you ask, we've got some, some slides that we didn't have time for. We've got to talk about how we would approach the onboarding problem with the reciprocity rate technology. Looks like we might be out of time, but maybe that's a, that's a, we can, I can definitely tell you about that afterwards. If anybody else is interested in how we're going to approach that onboarding problem with the rest of us. Well, thanks so much, Daniel. This mentioned last month, I said she was going to be here, but she's so busy, I had to focus on her business, and uh, so she's here tonight. So, thank you, Stacy. And she's going to tell us about CART, which connects rideshare companies and grocery stores to increase access to healthy food for transportation limited individuals. My name is Stacey Matlin and I'm CEO of CART. At CART we work to solve the issue of lack of adequate transportation to healthy, affordable food. And we do this for people like Leslie. So this is Leslie. She's one of 15 million Americans who lack access to a vehicle and receives food stamps. Um, she's unemployed and has two kids and struggles to get to and from the grocery store to provide for her children. Um, right now she currently is stuck with the bus. Uh, which limits the amount of groceries she can purchase at a time and tends to be unreliable. And, uh, or she could take a taxi, but a lot of the time she'll wait up to an hour and a half to get to the store and pay $30 for that round trip ride. Alternatively, she could go to her local corner store, but a lot of the times these corner stores uh, do not have healthy food. They're prepackaged and it's expensive. And so, all these options limit the amount of healthy food she can provide for herself and her kids. And this is where CART comes in. So at CART, we work to connect people like Leslie to rideshare companies and grocery stores. And we do this through a mobile web app where grocery stores can subsidize half of the amount of the ride. And then we uh, work with the customers to, so they can book a ride with the rideshare company. We do the coordinating with the rideshare company and can, uh, coordinate this whole system specifically tailored for people like Wesley. And in the end, the value for both grocery stores and rideshare companies is they get a new user base and a new way to spread goodwill across their community. 
And for people like Leslie, they now have a newfound access to healthy, affordable grocery stores. So how does it work? So Leslie can go in and she hears about Cart from her local pastor, logs onto our website and requests a ride. Um, she then enters some basic information, name and phone number, and then we send her a text so she can verify uh, her phone number. She then can enter her home address to order a ride. And she chooses the Meyer location and she sees that it will cost her $10 to get to the store. Um, and then she's notified that she will pay for the ride in the store and she will have to agree to pay for the ride in the store to continue. She then requested the ride and then is sent a text with the driver details, um, name, information, and then also a text with this barcode which she'll use to scan in the store um, to pay for the ride. So she then goes to the store, at checkout she scans this barcode and she's able to pay for the ride. Um, at, at the bottom of her receipt, she will receive a code, which she can then enter back into the app to prove that she paid. And then she can order her return ride home. So this is a process that has been refined after many, many uh, customer interviews and pilots. And our biggest pilot was uh, last year, May of 2015, with Meyer at their 8 Mile store in Detroit. Um, in this pilot, we operated as a call center, so people were calling in and we would manually be booking rides to and from the store, and they would pay us in the store. Um, we learned a tremendous amount in that month. One is that trust is a huge thing that we must consider moving forward, and it takes a while to build that trust. So a month was not a long enough time to really build that connection. And the other thing is that we definitely need technology to automate the process. So now we're taking those findings and doing another pilot with Meyer. this time at two stores, and it's running for three months. And in this pilot, we will have technology to actually automate the process. And also, we are now reaching out to the community to help with that trust. We're creating a community ambassador program where we're going to engage community members to be community ambassadors, tell their friends and family about our service, and then receive incentives for doing so. They'll also be part of a larger community board that will help us with business decisions and technology decisions so we know we're making the right product for our customers. And with this, we believe that instead of just 21 customers, we can reach hundreds of customers. Um, we're working with Meyer and Seamless, their Grand Rapids-based accelerator, um, and they are providing us with some initial funding for this pilot. But after the pilot, we are looking for um, additional funding to expand to other stores, um, both in the Detroit area with local grocers there, and to other Meyer stores in Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids. So with that, I thank you for your time. Please go to our website, cartrise.org, put in any comments, questions, sign up for our newsletter to stay involved, or come talk to me afterwards. I'm Stacy with CART, and I'm working so people like Leslie can now have newfound access to healthy, affordable food. Thank you. So I've noticed that um, your uh, your model is on demand um, for rides. Um, could you make it more um, it's predictable by um, making it like schedule based? So every Tuesday, uh, let's take a ride there. Uh, we can make it good in the future. We're working with Lyft. Um, okay. I believe their concierge service and that's how we're actually coordinating the rides. Um, but yeah, and they do have an option to schedule rides. But right now, for our MVP and our test, we're working just on demand. We'll see if that really requested in the pilot. Mm -hmm. so, so is there, is there some, some modification at the point of sale terminal that generates that one-time code? Yeah, so Meyer actually, it's really simple for them to do. They have a UPC, like a barcode that's scanned, and then in their system that triggers a Catalina print that can print, and then that, on that Catalina, Catalina print, there's a one-time use code that we verify with Meyer on the back end, and so that's when they actually and this is so the payment in the store is critical because this is the one thing we found after all of our customer discovery was that it wasn't the issue of smartphones it was more of the issue of the lack of trust of putting your credit card information into and just putting online platforms. Okay. Uh, working with the federal government for uh, financial assistance or uh, food stamp programs? Yes, <laughs> yes, we definitely have, and we're working right now to make. 
getting through how you can work with Medicaid um, on funding. What percentage of people today are not So you raise the point that people, it is possible people with overactive disorder are not pay. So this is a kind of an this honorable guess. But um, they would be able to do that once. They won't be able to work at a return at home if they don't pay. Do you need to put some uh, personal and uh, verifiable information? So they have their personal asking and they're going through, and we wanted to be on um, the very process as simple as possible because it's a uh, this is a population that um, is less active. Do you have any problems with getting lift to certain communities? And I know that there's some research on Uber, at least kind of like that line in certain districts and saying that they won't go there certain hours or just won't go there in general. So from our conversations with Lyft, they know that we're doing this, and there has been nothing to indicate that we would have issues, but that is definitely something to keep in mind um, as we move forward. How do you compete with uh, bigger companies that are out there? This is kind of a you know, dense space now with a bunch of other competitors. I mean, Amazon Fresh uh, is offered a bunch of major cities, and they offer like free delivery. So the problem with that is that um, our current population doesn't really do much of delivery. Like they don't, none of them had Ubers or Uber on one of them, they didn't really know what it was, and they don't do online shopping. And so that's why this one is specifically targeted for our current population. Is that like a $10 ride a lot for someone on food stamps? Um, so right now they're actually paying a lot of them are paying a lot more, and we're going to solve the ride. We're going to pilot to test to see if this is going to be affordable and kind of move around our pricing level there. How are they paying a lot more? Uh, people, the interviews we talk to, they pay more than they can afford. They'll pay thirty dollars for a taxi ride, or they'll pay twenty dollars for their friends and family to take them. And like that's a good going rate. Right? So when we when people set up like soft ten dollars. Given your model, wouldn't it be easier for a, a mother of two to be able to use like a Peapod or a Amazon Fresh and have it delivered to her door rather than put the kids and go to the store and do the shopping with kids wanting to pull stuff off their shelves and da da da? But you just basically make it easier for them to order it so that they can use like maybe voice activate. You know, most everybody has a cell phone, make it voice activated so you just, here's my shopping list and as soon as it's a repeat shopping list, yeah, I want the same thing as last week, delivered to my door, here's my address, and then save the 10 bucks, save the hour and a half, save the, the whole commute thing. So a lot of times grocery delivery services do charge a premium and also there's a lot of people with freedom to go to the store, choose their own produce and food, and that is a very helpful I know that you know a lot of the foundations are, and also you're set up to be able to take like program related investment from foundations uh, in any way. Uh, yes, we are to our pilots. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, you made it to the final pitch of the evening. Um, so um, please welcome Michael Fry from uh, Big Picture to come down. Uh, Michael and I met after the last uh, New Tech uh, at the end of it, and he's telling me, oh, yeah, I got this company I'm working on. I learned a little more about it. I'm like, you should pitch at New Tech. Uh, so Big Picture provides codeless web analytics that help you understand customer behavior and identify new leads. At a big picture that I have. Take it away, Michael. Hey everyone, my name is Michael, I'm the founder of Big Picture. So, Big Picture is a web analytics platform um, designed to help you understand customer behavior and identify new leads. And the problem that we're trying to solve is that most digital marketing tools require some level of coding knowledge. Uh, the majority of marketers can't code, so I saw this problem firsthand. When I was working as an engineer at Intuit, uh, a lot of marketers, product managers had a difficult time setting up analytics tracking software, uh, conversion tracking using like Facebook and Twitter campaigns. Uh, the second problem that I saw is that after you collect the data, actually getting actionable insights from that data is really hard. So spending hours going through uh, Google Analytics, 
uh, figuring out how to um, have like real actionable insights that you can use to improve your, your business. Um, so Google Analytics really is kind of the main player in this space. Uh, but from uh, talking to other people, it's extremely complicated. As an engineer, I found it very complicated to send data here and to work with it. Um, but it's very, it's very powerful. Um, but yeah, it's really, really, really complicated. So our solution is that we have built codeless tracking software. So we make it really easy to manage your analytics via a point and click uh, web app. So essentially, it's like Optimizely. People learn Optimizely for analytics. So this is a screenshot of our app. This is actually uh, our public marketing site that we're using our app to track analytics on. Uh, you can see that we're tracking uh, a list of different options such as the login click, how far people scroll on the page, uh, how people interact with the form on the page. So it makes it really easy to track a variety of different things. This is point and click and you can start tracking it. Uh, we also track more complex things like YouTube videos and also track uh, like micro interactions, so like very specific parts um, of the video. For example, like when the video is like 50% played or more, you can track uh, very specific things. And then it makes it really easy to analyze your data. Um, so here is our homepage. You can see how far people usually scroll down the page. So usually 64% of people scroll down about 25%. Uh, about 38% of people scroll down to the very bottom. So. Extremely useful, very simple, easy to read charts. And then our new feature, which is currently in private beta, uh, we're calling Big Picture Intel. Uh, so this helps you get insight on the anonymous users that are visiting your site. So pretty much uh, data that is very hard to access right now. It works by analyzing the IP address of the incoming user, and we're able to pull and um, identify the company that's associated with that user. So it's extremely useful for account-based marketing, identifying new leads, or optimizing our marketing pipeline. So how are we different than the other solutions that are out there? Uh, so we provide very detailed data uh, on user behavior. Uh, and we're able to collect this data just via a point-click interface. We also have a number of integrations. We actually have a deep integration with Google Analytics. So essentially, we make it easier to send data to Google and to pull data from Google and see without spending hours trying to figure out what's going on in Google. Uh, we also have other integrations with, uh, with Slack, with Segment, mixed panels, so you can pretty much send your data anywhere. Just trying to make it easier to manage your whole analytics stack. So as far as what's next, we are currently in uh, customer discovery and user research. Um, and we're looking for feedback on what, people are, what people's pain points are. But what we're looking into next is more automated analysis. So right now we have some very simple insights. Uh, but what, what we really want to look forward to is leveraging like machine learning to do more automated insights in like plain language. Uh, so for example, just having a straight text that, hey, uh, you should decrease your Facebook marketing spend because of all of your marketing campaigns. Uh, this is the lowest ROI. So just very simple, plain English on what you should do to uh, optimize your marketing analytics strategies. So that's it. Uh, you're welcome to try free on our website. It's uh, budgetpicture.io. And then the new product, if you're interested in the um, big picture Intel, the whole anonymous user tracking, that's currently private beta. You can check that out at uh, thebigpicture.io slash intel. And I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, I think about other people trying to address this issue of sort of figuring out what's driving user behavior and are they doing the things you want them to do on your website. And I think of Marketo, I think of HubSpot, and so you, you mentioned Optimizely, but I actually tend to think of those others. Have you given any, I mean, how do you compete with HubSpot, for instance? What's the difference? Yeah, actually, HubSpot is really based on, it's like a CRM. Yeah. Marketing actions. Uh, I think one of their biggest pain points to talk to your team is how you can use your setup with your product. Um, so this whole code tracking thing is particularly useful. Um, so actually, our initial approach was trying to uh, integrate with as many platforms as possible, get your front end and 
and yeah, the chief of staff. Um, and we uh, innovated to really having a direct integration for Google, so we really focused for up to now, uh, having a direct integration to Google, sending data to Google, pulling data, having insights to that. But we're exploring other opportunities for other integrations and uh, we're looking for these other uh, products around like that. How are you differentiated from a tag management solution? Like a tag management solution? Ah, so, yeah. Telium, for example, yeah. is well known in this space. Telium, Google Tag Manager, Segment, those are all the similar in this space. Uh, so, we're looking for other solutions that are You can easily have a copy of your script into your system and publish it. Uh, we're a similar asset in that you know, it's a lot of time to tell and you can publish changes whenever you want. Um, but ours is like uh, really good code aspect. So even with Google Tag Manager, you, can, you want it to install like a big tile. Uh, you still have to actually track all the different bats or it still requires a coding configuration that adds to those tags. So ours is like you get direct access to the APIs uh, so you can easily you do everything you could without any clicks. So back to the original question, I, I thought this might be a front end plugin to a CRM tool, but if I'm understanding you correctly, the value proposition is a standalone analytics system. And can you explain what that is exactly? Like how for example, do you sell to like a CMO, a marketing team, or a sales team? And if so, what is that value proposition? Yeah, so up until now, we're really focused on Google Tag Analytics. And we're finding that there has been more requests on uh, like potentially integrating with the server, whatever uh, your product is uh, Intel, uh, providing that and that is users and companies. Um, we're actually integrating with Close.io. Um, so we can actually automatically create new opportunities <coughs> and leads within your server. Uh, it's automatic. Uh, so yeah, that's been pretty cool. Actually, it notifies the whole team to get Slack too. There's a new company. Um, so, also, I was really focused on the analytics aspect, and we're trying to uh, do the user research to figure out uh, do, we, do we do more automated analysis on the analytics? Do we try to integrate from the platforms or do we go the marketing route? So, we're really looking for feedback right now. What do people, uh, what do people take when they talk to the people? So just to clarify, that, that's to maybe better qualify front-end leads before they go into CRM? Yeah, that's what we're going to build right now. It's going to be all the issues. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. How is this priced? Uh, yeah, so you can check out our pricing page. It's another good feature that I have. Uh, it can be priced by uh, session terminal. It's kind of the main driver. Uh, Core version is free, up to 5,000 sessions along the way, different tiers. Uh, it's on sessions. Um, so there's like $50 a month, $150 a month. Uh, it's based on sessions, uh, how many users can actually see through available, how many websites you can have for the product. And then for our new product, the Intel, that's at $100 a month for that. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? You bring up that it, it's codeless, and yet you're talking about all these checkboxes and, you know, kind of an interface. And my experience with that is, is it takes a similar logic to coding to go through and properly configure those checkboxes uh, to get anything useful out of the product. Or you wind up having to create simplified set scenarios, which is why I brought up um, HubSpot earlier, which is effectively, as you bring up a, a CRM. So how are you kind of attacking that problem of, okay, you've taken me out of, I, I don't have to worry about not having semicolons at the end of my line, but now I have to have the logic to go through these check boxes. How are you addressing that issue? So a lot of the tracking that we're doing is like still really complicated. Uh, even for a simple like tracking a link, yeah. uh, there's a whole level of engineering process that to do that. And so many of those companies did their copying and based code, and it's right. a long process to go through the whole development, the QA, the deploy, and then the company has like, um, you know, it's only deploying like a couple times a month. Uh, thing like this is great for teams to move fast, focus on core features, and periods of marketing to really 
you do the track events and act on them. So a lot of the data we're collecting is extremely hard to collect even as an engineer. And then you go through the whole process through engineering. Okay, next our YouTube video tracking. Uh, that would probably take an engineer at least three, four days to code, work with YouTube API, to test, go through the whole deployment process. With us, you end up going like 10 seconds, like a point click, done. So really up till now, we're really focused on making it easy to track data, and really kind of where we're at now, we have like a fire hose of data. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next. We offer actual insights, we offer actual actions, acting at that, like targeting actions. Uh, yeah, this is where we're at. We're doing user research to figure out next steps. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Enjoyed our five pitches tonight. Um, not done, done yet. yet. If you have any announcements to make, if you are hiring, uh, if you're looking for work, you're looking for a co founder, if you have another meetup, if you wouldn't mind just lining up along here and making your announcement. Uh, this also all is recorded and broadcast. Um, and you should also digitally add a comment to the, to the meetup group with whatever links or whatever you're pitching. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off. I run another meetup um, in the second Tuesday of every month called uh, Ann Arbor Product Meetup, along with uh, Angela Pete. And um, we've been going for about eight, nine months now. So if you're a product manager, product marketer, come check it out. Uh, we're also looking for anyone that wants to share a recent like case study learning they had um, in product management. And uh, next month we're going to be uh, hosted at Pillar downtown, and likely going to have uh, Luca, the VP of Product at Formlogs, talk about. Um, Jobs to be done versus personas. So that's my pitch. Sorry. Oh, it's uh, it's like six 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 thirty on a um, second Tuesday of the month. You can find it on meetup.com. Hi everybody, I'm Glory Singh. I'm from the Center for Digital Engagement at Eastern Michigan University, and I want to tell you guys all about the Digital Marketing Workshop. So it's an event coming up on November 11th. It's from 7:30 to 2 p.m. I have a bunch of flyers, so. You guys should come get them. We're gonna have a keynote speaker, Douglas Mott. He is the CEO of RepairClinic.com, and he has done, I think, sorry, six million dollars in sales just in his storefront in Canton, and over eighty million dollars in sales over online, and that is through a YouTube strategy. So that is just one of the speakers that are coming. There's also going to be speakers from Google, Facebook, Wormloo. Um, I prospect just a whole bunch of companies and there will also be breakout sessions for everyone to meet and network. It's a great opportunity. Digital marketing and tech are very closely related. So kind of combining those two fields. So I hope to see you guys all there. And again, my name is Glory Singh and it's the Digital Marketing Workshop on November 11th. Thank you. I'm Chris. Um, I work for Venture for America. I hope that many of you have heard of Venture for America as it's a fellowship program for recent college graduates that want to get into startup work and maybe potentially build their own business someday. Um, in the past, Venture for America has not had a local team member and now I am here. So um, I wanted to introduce myself and say that I live in Detroit, um, but I do come to Ann Arbor once or twice a month. I'm always willing to meet companies that are interested in Venture for America talent, um, or interested in hearing more about the program, and I, you know, I live and work here, so I'm always willing to meet people. So I wanted to introduce myself. Um, if you don't know Venture for America, it's an entrepreneurship fellowship for recent college graduates. Um, we match, we recruit, select, and train recent college grads to be awesome startup employees, and then match them with startups looking for talent. So that's what we do. How do, how do we find you? How do we find me? Chris at. I'll write it up here. Email me. What you write? Good handwriting. I'll tell you a little bit myself. My name is Vineet. I have a venture capital company in town, but I chair the TyCon. Uh, Ty is the largest entrepreneurship organization in the world. And we're having our uh, meetup, TyCon, on October 27th and 28th, right? Yep. Um, and we're still looking for one startup uh, fintech company. Uh, so if you guys want to attend, we have a special code for entrepreneurs uh, and for investors. 
So come reach out to us, please. And the website is tyconmidwest.org. I'll write it down. You want to talk about the FinTech a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a fantastic event to be at. It's, it's one of the largest global organizations, about 4,200 entrepreneurs. And, and FinTech is going to be interesting mainly because of uh, all the interest we're having with, uh, in the blockchain space. So if you are a company or an entrepreneur looking to build or are building applications using the blockchain platform, or any of the other fintech platforms which are out there today, definitely come talk to me or, or uh, talk to Vineet, and uh, we'll try and get you in there. Anything else, Vineet? Uh, I think 2728. 2728. Sorry, it's all there. Special discount code available. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Sorry. It's in uh, 2728 at the Henry at Dearborn. So this one is October. It's October. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, my name is Arvish. I'm talking with the number five. This is Steve. I come with a great idea for a new tech business. But Steve knew that ideas are not enough by themselves and that he needed a technical know how to put his ideas together. He tried a number of different options, but nothing seemed to work. Everything was either expensive, impossible, or unreliable. Sleep got confused, frustrated, and demoralized. But then Sleep found Innova 5. Innova 5 loved his idea and became a co-founder. But it helped Sleep refine his idea both technically and entrepreneurially by providing expertise in a cost-effective and flexible manner. The Enova 5 technical team then incubated a minimum viable product, enabling Steve to find early adopters, gain important market feedback, and secure seed investment. With Enova 5 support, Steve developed the product iteratively, gaining new customers, and accelerating his initial idea into a fully operational business. And today, Steve is a recognized entrepreneur. Enova 5 has nurtured many other ideas, turning them into reality. So, if you do have an idea, what are you waiting for? Let's see how you're Together. Thank you. You will find this fancy card here. You can contact me. You guys are local here in Ann Arbor. Yes. Uh, I got this piece in uh, Techberry with this card and mic. All right. So, you can, I'll be there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Timo Sessions, and I'm with the company that has developed a credit card that I will actually be coming back at the next meeting with, that you can download all of your current debit cards, credit cards, shopping cards, everything, and go to 1,500 stores that we are affiliated with and earn travel dollars. We're an ultimate travel company. Um, you become a member, you get to take trips discounted, you get to earn trips by shopping, and you get to earn trips by eating and dining at affiliated stores. Uh, companies that we work with. So I don't have a lot of the information, I just wanted to kind of come and introduce myself so next next month I'll have it. I will actually have the prototype. I'm one of the first thousand people in the country that, that is being allowed to beta test this for 30 days and then it's going to another 30 days for some more and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping to bring it to the area and share it with people so that I can get some help getting it out to the masses. So thank you. I am Prasad from Italy. I am here up here uh, recruiting people, uh, both the technical managers and also Java developers, and we make our products on the cloud. So I'll be hanging around here in this corner. So if anybody's interested, please contact me. Thank you. And I got a couple announcements, so I'll try to make them fast. Uh, one, I like to do another event uh, similar to A2 New Tech called A2 Brew Tech on the same A2 New Tech page. Uh, if you like drinking uh, and you like entrepreneurship, uh, you'll love these events. Uh, normally we have these events at Mezzavino, but unfortunately Mezzavino has closed down, so we still need kind of a venue. If you have any suggestions, go ahead and blow up anybody's mind there with that announcement. Uh, if anybody has suggestions for restaurants, um, reach out to me, otherwise you'll see it uh, posted tomorrow on the H2 New Tech page. Uh, 
Uh, second quick announcement, we have Coffeehouse Coders. I'm one of the co-organizers uh, of Coffeehouse Coders, which is a group that helps people learn how to code. So if you like some of the startups that you've seen here, you want to know how to build them, uh, come to our group. It's at Ann Arbor Coffeehouse Coders. And then lastly, um, if you're looking to hire, you, have, you want to see startup jobs here in Ann Arbor, uh, True Job actually is the site that me and Mike run, and we have the biggest selection of startup jobs outside of AngelList for Ann Arbor and Detroit. In fact, I think we're number one for Ann Arbor and Detroit. So, check us out. It's free to post or see listings, and we think you'll think it's pretty cool. So, yeah, well, we'll put it in the meetup afterwards. Thanks. I'm Steve. Uh, I also have two announcements for two different organizations. Uh, Alpha Django, we're a CTO and development team for hire for early stage startups. Um, we've worked with several of the startups in this room, even ones that presented tonight. Um, we are looking to hire developers uh, to work on these early stage startups. But uh, several of the startups that we're working with are also looking for developers, and I hate competing with them for developers. So. If you are a developer who loves startups, I would encourage you to first talk to those startups that are hiring. Um, if you are a developer who likes startups and suffers from ADD, and you like working on multiple different projects, then come talk to me at Alpha Django. Uh, speaking of startups um, that are hiring, that are starting to outgrow Alpha Django, I'm Steve. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Genomenon, which is a startup here in town that does genome uh, sequencing, uh, genome interpretation software for diagnosing, treating, and researching cancer. Um, we've raised our uh, seed round, and we are looking to hire um, our first full-time developer who's not me. So uh, if that sounds interesting, also come talk to me. Hey, I'm Adam. I'm a co-founder of MySwim Pro. We presented here a couple times. Um, we are the number one fitness application in the world for swimmers. Uh, we have over 100,000 registered athletes. Uh, we are currently in the semifinals for Accelerate Michigan, and we're looking to start our fundraising. So if, you're looking, if you want to help us grow, uh, come talk to me, especially if you are a swimmer. So thanks. And I want to talk, we are hiring, but I want to talk about that. I want to talk about actually a political appeal. I know it's not normally the kind of thing we do here. Um, although, you know, actually when Governor Snyder first actually went on his uh, whistle stop tour, uh, raising, you know, sort of support for himself, he actually started with this organization. People knew that. Uh, I actually saw Snyder last night, along with Jerry Anderson, who's the CEO of DTE, about a topic that we're all in support of that is actually very, very important. So uh, with the November, November election, there'll be a local vote on a regional transit millage. Um, those of you, are, are you guys familiar with that? Ooh. Yeah, all right. Well, those of you who aren't, and maybe folks who are, who are relatively new to the region, uh, this might be news, but actually public transit in Detroit sucks. And it's not just Detroit, it's actually regional, all right? So actually, if you consider our four county region that surrounds Detroit, uh, we spend $69 per capita on public transit versus even Cleveland that spends $177 per capita, Denver that spends 214, <laughs> Pittsburgh that spends 232, we suck at this. And so one of the challenges I think, there are two reasons I think to support the, the millage coming up here. Uh, the first is really jobs. 90% of jobs in the region actually are not reachable within an hour of public transit. Um, the second is really around equity, right? That uh, we have many, many folks in our community, uh, whether disabled or elderly, with millennial, that either can't or don't want to use cars right, to, to, to get to places. And um, the plan is actually an amazing one that actually connects Ann Arbor to Detroit, 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 Detroit to Willow, all this kind of stuff, with everything from rail, bus rapid transit, airport express, it's amazing. Um, check out rtamichigan.org if you want to find out more um, about the plan. But it is exactly what this, mission, what this region needs. And uh, again, I ask that all of you uh, if you can, try to support that and uh, let, let folks know. Thank you. Uh, lots of awesome announcements today. Thank you everyone who came down and volunteered. Um, that's our show. Thanks for coming out. Uh, if you know anyone that might want to pitch next month, again, reminder, organizers at a2newtech.org. We'll get your email to the right place. It's going to be right here, but upstairs, I think. Uh, on Tuesday, November 15th, and um, hope to see a bunch of you out at Pizza House later tonight. We'll be hanging out there and keep the conversation going.
Have a good night.